sun and give thanks for today and for our creation. We dodging another mile, which we dodging. Wabanagi Peach, we dodging another mile, which we dodging another mile. The Penobscot people have a long and rich history with their territorial homelands. They have always lived in harmony with creation. The Penobscot are living on land that we've been living on for, you know, 15,000 years. It's right smack dab in the middle of the Penobscot River from the ocean up through the mountains and the small lakes and streams. So, you know, through history though, we've been confined to the islands on the Penobscot River. So at one point that was devastating to us, but in, in now it seems more of a stronghold. It's actually helped protect who we are. Ego. Barry Dana is a member of the Penobscot Nation at Old Town, Maine. As a former chief, Barry makes it his mission to carry on the message of his people. I grew up on the Penobscot Reservation, um, right on the Penobscot River. Very native, very Penobscot, uh, but also holding a, uh, a high level of responsibility for maintaining, you know, being Penobscot. He grew up on Indian Island in Maine, on the reservation, and he has spent his life pursuing cultural activities, and that's what really drives him in his pursuits, is following his ancestors' paths. The Abbey Museum's collections comprised of objects representing 10,000 years of Native American culture and history in Maine. We have archaeological evidence of Native people living in Maine for 12,000 years, and so we have four communities in the state that are fairly recognized today, Passamaquoddy, Penobscot, Mi'kmaq, and Maliseet, and collectively they're known as the Wabanaki. Barry Dana is also a very talented artist whose work is well known. Barry Dana's introduction into the world of art was largely influenced by his love of the land and his people. Birch Bark is probably the number one, uh, as the way I like to uh, you know, think about it, number one resource of our people. Um, you take uh, this area, at one time was under a, a mile thick sheet of ice. So nothing obviously was growing then. But when that receded, like today, if you have a, a fire or you, you allow a field to come back into woods, first thing that grows is birch. So my thinking is, if that's the case, when our people first lived here, the first tree they would have encountered would have been birch, birch tree. There's hundreds of uses for birch bark. And uh, if you're going to study your own culture, uh, you know, besides language, you got to know how to provide for yourself. And with birch, you, you create canoes and housing and uh, receptacles, medicines, uh, eye protection in the winter, you know, leggings. I mean, the list is endless. Barry does some really extraordinary work. He started um, making birch bark baskets and really taking his art and taking those baskets to a different level, you know, really etching and doing the visual kind of storytelling and paint, things that he'd been doing in paint in that media, then onto the birch bark, which he continues today. 